Hello and welcome to Newsnight. I am Ladi Akiri Doluale. Thanks for joining us. My guest on the program today says removing the subsidy on the price of petrol without addressing other causative factors like foreign exchange rates would be an exercise in futility. My guest also says that incessant policy reversals and the absence of discipline to face vested interests down the years have made the implementation of national development plans almost impossible. Newsnight talks to elder statesman and former two-time Minister of Finance, Dr. Kalu Idika Kalu. Dr. Kalu, thank you for your time. Nice to see you again. Thank you very much, ladies. Great to see you too. We are, <coughs> as someone told me on this program a few weeks ago, that it, it, it appears as if we never stop talking about the same things. 40 years ago, Nigeria was at a crossroads economically. We were trying to determine where we wanted to go and all of that. But part of the reason why it's, I'm delighted to be able to speak to you is that people milestone and say that the decision in 1986 to introduce what was known then as the Structural Adjustment Program marked a turning point for the country. Some have said it was not a positive turning point. Others have said implementation was the problem. But as someone who was smack in the middle of it, uh, if, if to say at the time, what do you make now, especially with the benefit of hindsight? In answer to your question, we, we tried, but we could have done and should have done a lot better. First, by adopting some of the standard ways of adjusting your exchange rate. Secondly, and very importantly, we should have accepted that once you have the program, the economy can bounce faster, which means the exchange doesn't have to decline or it can recover faster. If you funded this program properly, that would sound very sensical. But not when people say, oh, we don't want this loan, we don't want that loan. By doing just that, you are in fact making it harder. For but you Nigerians did say they didn't want, which is what the, is, the what I'm saying. part that you mentioned. But they didn't understand that that meant that you are slowing down the recovery once you've got your own program. But then there were other aspects of it, of course, which I think maybe you'd like to speak about. Because sure. as you were speaking, there's a sense of deja vu yes, about yes, all yes. of this. Exactly. Because you could have been talking about what is going on now, right. even though you are talking about what about went that, on 30, 40, is, 30, Three and a half ago. decades after. Now, I, 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 and in that respect, I wanted to know um, there were certain policy reversals, even in what was initially planned. You've just given an example. The second tier foreign exchange market mm -hmm. was not part of the original program. Well, it, 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 oh, well, uh, well uh, you can say the statute of limitations should allow us to. In the interest of clarity, I'm moving ahead from here. The paper I delivered, the idea of, I thought I had discarded the second tier thing. I wouldn't say how I used to address this in a funny uh, display of tearing a piece of paper. Say, this is going to tear the economy. No, this is not what we should do. We should rather mobilize all the resources we can access. And that's where the, the, you get grants. You get a budget of 100. You can cover. 5% by grants available for social sectors. Everything I'm saying now, I've sent them up just time, outside to the media <laughs> on academic grounds in Lagos here and Ibadan and all that. Then from there, you go to the long-term financing. From there, you go to fi uh, commercial financing. All these are different levels of interest costs, maturity periods, and the time frame or uh, the maturity time frame of the of the loan once you've got that chances are your exchange rate you've met the supply meets your demand there's no reason for that exchange rate to depreciate but when you don't have enough when the, there's no certainty as to your ability to fund the program as designed then prices have to change because you are short of supply of foreign exchange in terms of the overall import content of your requirements. I don't want us to make this sort of very high technical. If you don't have enough money, your price will 
will decline. Your local price will decline. That is what is happening. That is what gives rise to subsidies. We'll be yeah, talking, so we'll be talking about, about that. About that, because yeah. I, that brings you know, me to the issue of we've got another plan now, which has just been unveiled. There is a, what is called the National Development Plan 2021 to 2025. Yes. Um, it's part of a long-term thing, which actually is supposed to go all the way to 2050. Yes. Now, when, when we are supposed to be third in the world in population, in terms of population. And maybe ninth in GDP. Well, I wonder. Third yes. in the world we might make in population. But not that the ninth. GDP well, better, we have to get ourselves. Now, but uh, why I link it mm. is because a lot of what you said mm. about the previous, mm. the structural adjustment plan and other plans that came thereafter, yeah. Vision 2020 mm. and all, amongst others, mm. suffered from this same two basic maladies. Yes. Assumptions that didn't pan out. Mm -hmm. And secondly, policy reversals. So mm -hmm. the original plan was difficult mm -hmm. to recognize by the mm -hmm. time you were halfway mm -hmm. through the implementation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Vested interests will have stepped in. Mm -hmm. People, who, as you said, who didn't like one portion or the mm -hmm. other exactly. would lobby and have many of those exactly. things exactly. changed. Mm -hmm. So today, we have, for example, the basic thing that appears to be the major problem that everybody may be highlighting is the forex, mm. the foreign exchange market. Mm. Just mm. this morning, I was reading that many of the airlines had asked their travel agents to stop issuing tickets mm -hmm. for people whose travels do not originate or terminate in Nigeria. Why? Because they have more than $200 million in country that they are unable to repatriate back home because there's a shortage of foreign exchange. <laughs> Now, mm -hmm. if, if, that, if that were true, if that was the situation, it comes back to what you were saying Precisely. about the situation 35 Precisely. years ago. Pre not just that. You see, you talk about policy reversals. I also had a rumor about how the domiciliary account will be closed down. You can't give an undertaking. Uh, when the domiciliary account was being started, I don't know if you remember my friend Ahmed, he was governor of the central bank yes, then, they were all very excited Ahmed, and they yes. come up with this thing and I told him, I said, this is all these uh, uh, administrative changes are not the real thing. The real thing is the deregulation. Once you deregulate, as you deregulate, your domestic and external prices are aligned. You, we people, whatever way people want to keep their savings, you don't have to say you have to do the military or not. Everybody manages their own account. But that was really quite lost, and people thought you had to have a way of trapping them. There was another funny notion that uh, uh, because our exchange rate, uh, we are short of foreign exchange, foreigners would just come and buy up our whole stock market. So there should be no voting rights for foreign holders, I say. That is just the wrong signal. If you are going to ask somebody who is investing from Hong Kong or London or somewhere, as, as nationalistic, as that may sound, you are in effect discouraging them from bringing in their money. When you say, oh no, we can't let you have a voting right. They may not want voting rights as such, but they certainly should have their right to earn what every other Naira or Rubu or, or Euro will earn. Leveling the market, that is part of the, the regulation. So that's what we are saying now. By the time you start introducing all these funny ideas as to how the flies that should be butch will go and originate here. Uh, you better look at why, what you can do about your foreign exchange situation. In terms of mobilization, in terms of allowing the, ex the, the price that, is, that resembles the equilibrating result of supply and demand. That's how it's done the world over. And those are the signals that will bring about a reversal of the shortfall. People will inf invest when they think the price is right. If the price is wrong, they are not going to come in, whether it's a command economy or which have been given up by the Russians and the Chinese. They, they've tried all that, and everybody is back to that. So it's not just a matter of policy reversal. You are actually vitiating the whole point of having a free market economy when you start bringing in all kinds of uh, studs and <laughs> all kinds of uh, but do we really have a free market economy? You mentioned mm. the issue of subsidies. Mm. It's proven to be a drain pipe, and again, like most other things that are Nigerian, mm. Mm. there are different schools of thought. There are those who say, well, actually, it's proven to be a, dim, a drain pipe, not because subsidies are in themselves bad, 
but because of the way we have operated our Pre own system. Precisely. Now, Precisely. we are back to the argument. Exactly. In 1986-87, we had the same argument. Mm. Should we pull off the subsidy yeah. and allow mm. uh, market forces to determine the price of petroleum products? Mm, mm, mm. Dr. Carlo, almost 40 years later, later we, we are still discussing about A few this. years ago, I was out there in the street. Of course, I actually got to the street, not to oppose removing subsidies, but to say professionally, you, you are managing the entire economy. You are not just managing a price system. So if you let it accumulate, in order not to do injury to the relative stability of the system, then you decide explicitly how you remove the subsidy. That was the only, but a lot of people say, ah, but you were there saying they should not. I said, no, no, no. And uh, Ngozi knows here, she and I talked about that. I said, no, I'm not objecting to it. In fact, I started the whole process. That was a major part of my paper, namely that this is a Ngozi major. you mentioned, of course, being Dr. Okonjo Iwela, now yes, yes. DG of WTO. Right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You okay. know, she came into the World Bank just the year after I left, but we were always in contact, you know, that sort of thing. I was very happy when she agreed to come and serve here. But there were several minor, minor discrepancies here. Yeah, they were like the debt relief thing that... Uh, they we're still going to talk about that because it's one of the issues <laughs> that I intend to bring and up of with course you. The, so because, um, as you will expect, two people may not necessarily have the same idea, but we better spring from the absolute correct theoretical basis, you know, on, on that. So the question about um, subsidy. Subsidy is an old instrument. It's a positive instrument. When it is deliberate way of, of buying time to allow the system to grow. If you have the funds, you can cushion the impact on your domestic producer by giving subsidies. And that goes from farmers to manufacturers to all sorts of things. But you also have to weigh it against the cost. You always have to weigh it against the cost of, of push, putting subsidy. And that's where we come to the question. Of, it's not so much subsidy as to how much subsidy. The other day, somebody was saying, ha, ah, what is this? If we remove subsidy, and then we are, we are going to give away more than we've lost by the subsidy. You know, that's, that's a, a way of referring to the same thing. Um, and subsidy uh, could be something used for a phase. It's not for an all-time thing. You phase it because of the objective to encourage production, to, en to improve resource use, to improve the balance of resource allocation, maybe incomes, and so on. You say, okay, uh, uh, you, you, you can give subsidy to public transport in order that it could be cheaper for those who don't have the ability to have their own transport, cars. You can subsidize trains so that it remains, the <laughs> prices remain low for the mass who go by mass transit, which is what we introduced uh, when Another I was Minister yes, of Transport. Yes. You know. So, in this case, why it is so dangerous is that by, by the time he reveals the fact that you are not managing the exchange rate. I do, uh, Larry Somers, famous economist, you know, Larry Somers, head of Harvard College and at one point. He came in once and we were in Abuja and uh, he was sitting by me and he was saying, why is the Nigerian fuel price so low? And I leaned over to him and I said, it is the exchange rate. He said, ah, oh, no. <laughs> you see, he never thought about that. Of course, immediately he got it. So when we don't manage the exchange rate, that's when the subsidy will, will arise because the domestic price will appear to be going up for our fuel while the domestic price is stratified or held up because of government price control. So you can't remove the subsidy without addressing all the macroeconomic determinants of domestic price of petroleum government control or other prices, inadequate uh, production, uh, 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 frictions in the importation flow, you know, the supply chain as we call it these days, right. which is really it has an old concept, but we make it sound like it's a new concept, you know. So you, you say remove so much, ah, but we removed it last year. Of course you can remove it last year, but if you are doing the same thing that will affect your relative prices, your exchange rate, your interest cost, and other price indications in the price system. You have to face this issue about 
price differentials that force people to want to carry off your fuel to sell across the border, even if you, if you station battalions to prevent it. The battalions may begin to wonder whether they are in the right business. <laughs> Did. So, did. so, so you have to do more than just remove subsidies. You have to address the underlying factors that determine the extent as well as the depth and the quantum of the subsidies. Twice now you've mentioned the issue of foreign exchange management. Yes. Again, 30, 35 years ago, this was a <laughs> sore point. <laughs> and we're still talking about it today. At that time, there were arguments when the Naira was going to be exchanging for a six dollar to a dollar. Yes. Those same arguments yes. are still on that the Naira is exchanging 500 now to one dollar. <laughs> what are we doing wrong? What are we doing wrong basically, Dr. Carl? Well, you, you said there's no such thing as a market system of, or I don't know how you that put we are, it. That we're not really, are uh, we operating a market we system? Are, we are not operating the market system the way it should be. You see, because those impulses that spur reactions, autonomous reactions to demand and supply for foreign exchange, autom autonomous flows of foreign investment, and so on and so forth. We bring in all kinds of constraining factors within, built into our policies that inhibit that market system from, from operating in a way to on its own, in the classical sense, elicit those responses. You go to Igbo or go to Ibuteiro, any of our markets, the, the, the buyers and sellers, they don't need any theoretical foundations to respond to these things. So it is not as if it's a foreign ideology uh, invented by the IMF or the World Bank or the ILO or the ADB. This is the basis of, uh, of free production, free resource allocation, right in our villages from time immemorial. All the economies have done is to, <laughs> is, is to model this Things human, up and make them more fanciful. Exactly, make them and call them fanciful names and change this new once in a while to tickle their fancy and people will say, hey, they come up with a new idea. But in fact, it's still from the old Adam Smith comparative uh, uh, adventure and so on. So, so we've not allowed resources to flow freely. So we have been intervening. Most countries do it, but when you do it, so overtly, if, it's, if these are minor changes, okay, it will be almost imperceptible by the, by the market actor. But when these are major changes, when you are talking about an exchange rate is 300 and some people are getting at 400, it's very difficult to, to say that's a free market. Of course it is not, regardless of the, the reasons why we are doing so. Particularly when then this lasts for a week not to talk of a year or years. So there are many actions that we take that vitiate the market mechanism. Others do that, you know, you talk about uh, moral suasion, or all kinds of ways of restraining uh, uh, certain types of consumption through the use of tariffs and taxes and That's so right. on. Yes, but this have to be marginally insignificant to the overall base of your price. Otherwise, you are actually undercutting all the benefits that come from operating the market system that gives signals to every operator, from the smallest to the largest. I know this might sound like a high valuation macroeconomics, but as I said, you go to the markets, that's what they do. If you don't change your price, people will come and buy from you or run away from you. and. Uh, Stock it, stock your thing right beside you where you <laughs> lost the market. Yes. So you have to let the master market reflect this demand and supply. What you can do is to be refining the demand and supply, but don't don't go and impose a price. You can't impose a price. You no. can affect supply, but you, you have to deliberately affect demand by its policies and then let the price be determined. So that is that is one solid explanation for what we are doing wrong. We may be doing it just more wrong than some other countries that have succeeded better than we have. How do we correct that without losing control? Because mm -hmm. uh, some of those I've spoken to have said, mm -hmm. yes. Control is a problem. Why, what control do you want to have? Uh, in the when, sense when the underlying basis for the control are not there. So it's an imaginary control. Thing. Yes. Well, because what they said, well, what, what, yeah, what they said was that 
given the fact that no country completely allows market forces to determine uh, its for uh, its uh, foreign exchange management to the extent where the currency becomes worthless. That mm -hmm. even the most advanced capitalist mm -hmm. systems, from time to time, when it goes beyond a particular mm -hmm. level, they intervene to bring it back because it has other implications, which may in fact sometimes even impinge on sovereignty mm -hmm. of that territory. Mm -hmm. And that, but that in our own case, it's either we are at one end or we are at the other end. Well, and the person gave me the example. He said, which other country? He said I should name two other countries in the world where you have 10,000 bureau de change mm -hmm. operators. Well, this, I addressed this. A friend called me and said, Dr. Carl, you must agree that this bureau de change, I told him, I said, the bureau de change have nothing to do with it. It is the display of differential pricing. That's what created it numerous bureau de change. If the price is right and they can make the normal margins from being retailers to the consumer at the, at the bus station or rail station or the airports, you won't have so many of them. It's not going to be worth their while. But you give it to them at a price that is 10%, 25%, 50% better than what, what they will get it in the banks. Why wouldn't they mushroom? So it's not, in, it's not the bureau de change that's the cost. It is the institution that allows this wide variance of the same price for the same product, whether it's beans or yams or bread or foreign exchange. Once you create that disparate, distinctively different prices, you have the same proliferation for those who are making the most from that system. That's where you stop it. It's not, it's not to control it. But the, to answer your question, how often do we discuss uh, uh, exchange rate manipulation in Britain or Europe or in America? They, they may do the open market operations, uh, changes in money supply, and so, but it's always very infinitesimal. But of course, in terms of overall effect, because of the share volumes involved, that's where it counts. So we, they, it becomes a non-issue because it's already accepted that you can't do more than that by adjusting. Maybe there's a, a blight from weather conditions or from other uh, unpredictable phenomena. Then you want to adjust something to enhance your exchange or something of this. But certainly not to the uh, level where you are affecting a significant uh, proportion of that price because that price has to reflect, even that disaster, it will reflect and so on. And that is what moves you to immediately, but if you have to control it, that also limits your ability to respond. So it's a very wrong argument. It's a fallacy to say, no country ever, I used to hear that, I just shake my head as a for Christ's sake. No country ever allows its foreign exchange, no, that is not true. You may allow variations, but it's infinitesimal. It is insignificant in terms of the overall base of the foreign exchange, in, in terms of the weight of the market determinations of the exchange rate. Now, that is what we have had difficulty in maintaining. Part of it is that we also prejudge what we should. Vested interests. Of vested interests, but we have all these notions like if you know that it's an, a seasonal thing, you can borrow appropriately. But when we have to worry about whether it's IMF loan, which, which, uh, which is a wrong borrowing, regardless of the terms. You see, nobody ever discussed the terms of this loan. The more advanced, the more knowledgeable politics, or shall we say, the politics where they listen to the experts, <laughs> know, know what to do. Because essentially, when you are borrowing, you go from the least cost of funds, the, the, the funds with the least cost. That's why the IMF comes in. People are members, is the cheapest. By the same token, the IMF doesn't care to lend to you. If you just implement their, their rational economic policy, if you don't want the money, thank God, because they will just give to others who need it. But we made it look as if it was a snare to <laughs> trap us. You see, once you have the wrong sense of how you now finance your shortfall, you finance your shortfall by borrowing smartly from grants 
to the IMF, to the ADBs and the IDAs of this world before you get to the World Bank proper, uh, before you now get to the commercial banking, before you go to whatever uh, high interest costs, which you may need to do if, if you are trying to fill 100% of your shortfall. That is the sequence. So you start with the ones with the cheapest, whether it is called IMF or FMI or ADB or World Bank or whatever it is. These are some of the things that have lingered in our minds. And let me just say this, as I said, the statute of limitations should allow us to go back and find our, you see, it's okay when you are getting this from market women and tailors, I'm not saying those are the, <laughs> the least involved here. We are getting it from, supposedly those who should be learning, who should be teaching the subject even. But somehow they've been blindsided by some of these basic theoretical foundations. They just are blindsided. Like uh, somebody who will say, oh, we are never going to devalue the Naira. Nobody says such a thing because circumstances may force you to devalue after some progressive depreciation or do the opposite after some successive appreciation. You find that you are losing your market because your currency is too strong. So you want to take action. Of course, many countries want to be in that state where they can now adjust. But that's another scenario that's quite plausible. And it has happened. In case of China and some of the they are pushing them out, ah, come on, your yuan is too low. You are underselling us because your yuan is too low. And other people are saying, we don't want to get our Naira to go down. <laughs> and then you cannot break into the export market. So again, like in science or in other areas, you have to have that balance. That balance applies in economics as in other fields. Are we, are we doing that, do you think, in our own, uh, are, we, are we borrowing smartly? Because again, that, when you were talking about it, that brought me to something else, which is contentious. Um, mm -hmm. And you made reference to it when you, you talked uh, a bit earlier. Uh, a lot of people felt relief, maybe wrongly, but they felt relief when uh, President, as he was, as he was then, Obasanjo, mm -hmm. working in concert with uh, Dr. Konja Wella and a number of others, mm -hmm. negotiated this debt relief that mm -hmm. made Nigeria exit mm -hmm. most of the accumulated debt mm -hmm. that it had had all the way back, some yeah. dating back to the 80s, all the way up until, I think, 2005 70, or 2006. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. yeah. and once that happened, that freed up what we used to use for debt servicing mm -hmm. and so on. But then, in the last couple of years, we started it again, such that people are saying today, mm -hmm. we are probably in hawk for more than we were when General Obasanjo negotiated the relief. Obviously. Now, let me explain. What I'm explaining is standard. I don't care who else. Will. <laughs> well, if it's so standard, yeah, yeah, yeah. then how come others don't know it? Well, so, that, Dr. That, Kali, that's the difference. Why you should explain. That is the difference. That is the difference, with all due respect. You see, we are a developing country. One of the things we, I'm now sort of leading you to, I wrote a paper on this, and it was received in Abuja. We are a developing country. We have one thing that is clear by definition. We have needs you can enumerate them. Yes. Power, <laughs> mass transit, rails, all season roads, communications, housing, water, health, education, my goodness. By the time you enumerate this, regardless of the stock of our debt, the smartest thing to do, to go to your Creditor and say, look here, look at all the problems we have. Yes, we've tended to default here and there. We want to now play the game right. We pay right. You see our problems reschedule. We we pledge. If there's a way of tying up <laughs> governments to come, they must stick by the rules thereafter. You can't say, oh, you don't want to pay this debt. Oh, you don't. When you don't want to pay, you call in your creditors. You explain you reschedule. In the same way, you can tell them, look at our problems. We're a developing country. Give us maximum debt relief. Many countries got maximum debt relief. But not a Nigeria at its level to be giving away 15 billion or 18 billion. 
to write off its debt. Because that 15 and 18 is far more useful to Nigeria than can, that it can ever be to the Paris Club. That, was, that is the standard thing that should have been happening. And I know I argued this with my colleagues, and they saw the point, but it was already, if you like, water under the bridge. Under no circumstances should Nigeria be the transferring billions to Paris Club. Paris Club should understand our argument. We are going to reschedule our debt, forgive all, all these ones to uh, nursing women and um, for malaria, for all sorts of things. They will readily write off those ones. We know what the stock is. We see what our medium term balance of payments look like. In other words, our debt carrying capacity, given our four year, 10 year program. We are going to stay with the debt service because we can service the debt if we stick to it. The rest, it was 10 years, 15 years. They will say, thank you, provided you stick to that plan. Maybe we'll have invested that money. Of course, the, the argument that, wow, we are going to waste it. There. Well, if you are going to waste it, it has happened now. But you didn't have any creditor telling you, ah, 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 don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. Um, at that time, we had never borrowed. In fact, we lent. I was in the World Bank, and uh, when we were questioning Nigeria, buying IMF, essentially lending to the IMF by buying IMF papers to raise funds like more advanced countries. Nigeria, we were so loaded with foreign We were lending to the IMF. And here we are, we say, ah, nobody ever borrows from the IMF and survives it. And this is not coming from your bystander or layman. This is coming from people who should be. No. So, so it was not exactly an optimal approach. And I wrote about it. It was on the internet for years. And a lot of people knew about it, including people who are in charge. And I always, uh, our friend, I always, whenever he starts talking, I always, ah, 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 and then you. <laughs> <laughs> so this regarding, I hope I'm clear there. Yes, I, uh -huh. I, I get the point. Yeah, the point. in terms of optimality. That wasn't quite optimal. But now, again, we are in hawk. Well, As of now, today, now we are spending almost everything we make on debt service. No, no, no that's totally out. Tot with all due respect, I, I know those there may as you just say, oh, Dr. Kali is always rather dismissive. You see, the question is, you've got to take more time to assess the situation with all due respect to our successors and so on. You have to spend more time. You have to, you have to be open to question, to all questions. You don't have to have pre, 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 uh, uh, pre, a priori objections or conceptions of this sort of financing or not. I, I was quite, uh, I was not quite eager for setting up like a debt management office outside the control of the Ministry of Finance. I'm not saying it's totally out of the control, but you see. The, 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 the Ministry of Finance, working with planning and working with CBN, they should be the ones that are really coordinating in a developing setting. I know they front all this independence of CBN and the rest of it, but when I was finance minister, it was just taken for granted. That's how the Nigerian Economic Summit started. I will invite all these people in my parlor. We sit down, even a few foreign uh, investors, private sector. We discuss policy so that you can't be too far wrong. Everybody is throwing their own uh, bit. Um, you, you, it's easy to see that we are not as careful in evaluating our problem in terms of our expenditure decisions. You were talking earlier about resource mobilization decisions and the components of that resource mobilization, uh, our savings our tax, our tariffs, uh, direct autonomous flows, and so on. So we can identify a possible gap. And then the objective question is, given this gap, how do you fund this gap? You have to quickly, and that's why you have to have people who really have, if you are grounding on this, so it doesn't take forever. You don't have to start with uh, any fundamental education on this. So that when you are borrowing, it is clear. You identify the direction of the borrowing. At the time you mentioned the borrowing, 
Paris Passu, you talk about the interest cost, <laughs> the grace period, which means you have enough time to build what you are going are borrowing for before you start paying back. Ideally, you should be paying back from the from the Proceeds revenue stream. Revenue stream. You can't just talk about borrowing, borrowing, borrowing without referring. I know that the people in the ministry know, but the general public needs to know. There are people in the general public. You can do the analysis at what interest cost, with what grace period, with, with what, what maturity. Of course, the more lumpy the asset, the capital against which you are borrowing, ideally you should be borrowing long term. You can't be borrowing short against a project that mature in 10 years. You, you start repaying in, a, in six months or 18 months or less. It's just not done. So, costarily, one can say, without being dismissive, that uh, we've been borrowing a little haphazardly, and we should take a pause and review this before you go yes, on. You were, still, uh, uh, you, you were making the point that it, if, if you are going to borrow, yeah. because I was going to ask about the whole issue of debt to GDP ratio, because those in charge now talk mm -hmm. about the fact that, it's that people talk about we seem to be again back in the debt over. Yes, yes, yes. They yes, say, yes. well, the debt to GDP yes, ratio no, is very Those things low. Are, are misplaced. Those retorts are misplaced. It's not just the ratio. It's also the content of the absolute amount. It's also the, what we call the grant element. The grant element measures how well you have borrowed as measured by, by the fact that it's, you borrowed in a way like you are given a grant of so many years. By the time you reduce your interest cost and your, and your grace period to the cost of the borrowing, you find that it's very cheap. It's, it's, it, you, get a, you can get a long-term bilateral loan that almost comes close to a grant because of the share time frame. Like IDA funds that required you just no interest, you pay a commitment charge of three quarter percent, you have 10 years grace, and you have 30 years to pay. I mean, who would want to borrow that? But there will be nothing attaching to that borrowing. If you leave that because there's nothing that comes to it, we are not going to go into details about that. And you go and borrow for five years from some uh, run on the mill financing house, and you come and say, oh, you've got the answer, you've got the funds to do it but you borrowed in a way to burden the project and burden the economy because of the repayment terms falling due so prematurely. So, um, as I said, maybe precisely those who were always opposed to borrowing say, ah, going borrowing is going and sorrowing. They forget that every country has had to borrow from America. America was, has been the biggest borrower, probably still is the biggest borrower, but they've structured the system so that they are Financing their debt, and you know, recently they said they were not going to vote to increase the debt limit. That's that's how America talks about its debt. That is to vote more debt. They do that and they go ahead. But there will be systems to make sure that they they review what they are doing, who's doing it, and on what terms it is been it is being carried out. So those are all the things that have gone wrong. That is why it seems we are still marching time or even marching backwards, backwards in terms of the subjects that we talked about during this. So, you know, again, when the people say during the structural adjustment program, there is no such thing as during the structural. There is always structural adjustment going on. It's not an ancient thing that happened in the 1980s. And from the 90s, we, we left structural adjustment behind. Every time there are major indicators in your whole cost production function in your whole supply chain function, you are faced with a new set of conditions that require you to restructure to get yourself to the at least the minimum, the, the, the minimum optimal, the short term optimal. Say, so, okay, I have to adjust. In other words, every economy to stay alive has to be adjusting. So it is very wrong to think of structural adjustment in the past tense. There are just new conditions. Never mind whether you call it by that time or not. It's always an ongoing process. Again, nothing I've said here I didn't say during those heady debates. There's value added tax. When yes. you were talking about taxation and raising of taxes, there's value added tax. Now, what has generated controversy most recently mm -hmm. is not the 
collection of the tax. I mean, what the collection. The sharing. the sharing started. Mm. And then those who mm. felt that the whole argument wasn't being looked at completely mentioned the issue of collection. Yes. That the, the collection was vested in the federal government. I introduced the value added tax. So That's what I'm asking you. That's what I'm asking you. That <laughs> okay. Is this argument valid? Because there are two schools. Mm. There are those who say, well, those who generate it should be given more. That's one side. The other side is that, uh, yes, if we go down that line, then it's going, there's going to be a scramble. Yes. As uh, the governor of Jigawa told me, every state governor at the state level can then impose some level of taxation of on course. goods consumed within his own of jurisdiction. Course, of course, so of very course. soon you have the manufacturers paying 20, 30, mm. 35, depending on the number of states, different. taxes, different yeah. taxes, because everybody wants to collect his own since of you course. are keeping what you collect. Well, in a sad sense, this just tells you how poorly the nation has done. Federal, state, local, in resource mobilization. There was a famous political scientist, uh, Karl Deutsch, I believe, who looks at uh, the whole idea of social mobilization. Uh, when a government mobilizes its people, it's not just to, to generate revenues to serve the people. It's also to fund the proliferation of services so when there is a low revenue generation, and ours is a classic case, and we've uh, ad infinitum talked about how we've depended on just the oil revenue and so on, there was no reason why we should have done that. It's just, quote, laziness on the side of government, and also improper politics, where representatives were not put up to the task of delivery to their constituencies, health, education, roads. You can even say farm implements, seedlings, uh, motive power for village, town, farmers, whatever, different levels of agriculture. See, we, this got to a head because all of a sudden we looked around, nothing is, everything is going down. I'm not talking about being cut down by inflation, but even in nominal terms, the revenues are going down, so you're fishing around to see where you complain. In other words, if you are mo mobilizing resources optimally from an economy that was properly restructured when we were talking about this in the mid-80s, right. such will be the revenues that, regardless of the amount of value added tax, never mind that it is still at the level we put it in. The Ghanaians came and I said, where, where do they wanted to discuss introducing their own, and I said, we are starting at 5%. They thought they were being very smart. They went back and put them at 15%. Of course, they had riots. Some of our people here quickly said, ah, is the IMF, you see, they are out in Ghana. <laughs> and I said, no, no, no. I had told them 5%, but they thought they could do more. So they could jack so it up. IMF didn't even know when they got to that. Of course, they got to hear about it when the riots started in Ghana. So it's a reflection of low performance in generating overall revenue. But more germane to your question, um, I asked one of my lieutenants, because this is a long time ago, I said, are you, are you, could you guys go back and just remind me, how, what did you do about how you share this? And uh, at that time, of course, uh, as now, majority of that is still collected from federal locations, airports, seaports, and so on and uh, major establishments, you know. And uh, if other resource sources had grown the way they should, pari passu with the growth of the economy, the relative share of VAT will be infinitely smaller than it is. But I agree with you that, in fact, that is a, a, a dictum in tax theory, that uh, those who pay more should get more subject to the feeling of uh, altruism, subject to the feeling of, uh, feeling of uh, you can call soft, safety net. You know, you want to, you are not going to say that because people are unemployed or they are sick or because they are under age, they should not benefit f 
from because tax. Because they are not paying tax. Exactly. So those are the factors that informed us. With everything you've done, everything you've done, both in public and private, and with the benefit of hindsight, some of which you've shared with us during the course of the interview, do you think, looking ahead now, do you think that Nigeria can or will get it right eventually? Hmm. The only hesitation I have, obviously, are the provisos. It will be almost as irrational to say yes as to say no. You can say yes because I, in fact, I wrote something in reaction on, I think on Facebook, so I'm very engaged with these discussions on Facebook. There are people who delight in always tickling me by tagging me, you know. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't initiate the discussion, but I always, you know. As I React. Say, I always say, in Europe, you say, you're a motor, you, you, <laughs> you sneak in on the discussion. On <laughs> you sneak in on the discussion, but you don't initiate it by now coming heavily. You see, um, there is no reason why we should not. For instance, we are identifying our people. So many of them are abroad. It's also true that they are doing what they are doing abroad. Positive things. Like you had uh, uh, this guy who does this thing on Sunday, Farid Zakari, say, yes. how can you be putting up police against Nigerians? Can't you see Nigerians are higher on the average are against Germans and the English? And he mentioned all the European groups. Nigerians were any more, paying more tax, doing more this, doing more this, there. By the same token, is this shoil, as they say, stupid, is the shoil. If the shoil is right, <laughs> they will do it. If you bring Nigerians back there and change the environment, and this is the whole talk about restructuring, I've been very much involved with these discussions. And what I said this morning on, on my write-up is that, there is no reason why that should be in contention. If people think that we should think a little with the structure, we have to answer the question. Do we want to develop into a modern industrial nation? Most Nigerians will say yes. Most who understand what that means. What that means. <laughs> what that means. We'll unequivocally answer in the affirmative. That is the proviso. Once we agree, then next, what will we have to do to get there? So sure, we can get it right if we all agree, and if we also assent to the necessary adjustments, economic, administrative, constitutional, legal adjustments that we have to have. Dr. Kalu, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank, Thank you, you very so much, much for your time. We Thank you. you well. Thank you. That's today's program. Thanks for watching. Would like to know what you think of this conversation. Our social media handles are on your screen. You can also listen to previous episodes of the program via our podcast. Please visit our website, channelstv.com forward slash podcast to get started. I am Ladi Akiri Duluale. Goodbye. Thank you.